Well, hello and welcome to the Smells Like Money podcast. Join me, Suzanne Chin Taylor, the Doo Doo Diva, as I interview guests who are making an impact on how we manage and operate systems for conveying and treating wastewater. As a veteran of the wastewater, trench list, and civil infrastructure industry, each week I'll be bringing you industry know how from industry pros who know how. Join me each week as I speak with representatives of organizations that are utilizing disruptive or new technologies and methods, and executives who are excited to share how to be successful and sustainable in our vital industry. So whether you want to learn about the latest trends in technology, in treatment or trench lists, gain tips on training and retaining great talent, or simply how to be more efficient, productive, or profitable, this podcast is for you. Ready? Let's dive right in. Well, hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Doo Doo Divas Smells Like Money podcast. I have the privilege today of visiting with Tom Mong, the operations supervisor at the city of Jerome in Idaho. And the reason that I'm bringing Tom onto the show, I actually had never met him before this and really got to know him through LinkedIn, the greatest networking platform in the, in the, on the planet. And what attracted me was this very interesting post that Tom made regarding operators and licensing and incentivizing people that take the time to better themselves. And, you know, we we talked a little before we got on the air today. And one of the things that we're all aware of in this industry is we're facing a crisis of the silver tsunami and also having great difficulty in bringing new people or new blood into the industry for treatment plants and operators and collection system operators who fall in love with the industry as much as Tom and I did. And so I wanted Tom to share with me and with you, of course, a little bit more on the take on that post that he wrote so eloquently that I really think we all need to have. It's a difficult discussion. It might bristle a few people. And so if it does, oh, well, but I think it's worth bringing to the airwaves is that how can we as municipal utilities, even as utilities that are privatized, the importance of grooming great operators And what do we have to do in regards to those licenses and helping people become better operators, Tom? And then at the end of it, how do we keep them? Right. Well, I just wanted to thank you uh, for having me on the show. Um, It's a it's a cool opportunity and and I've enjoyed uh, listening to some of your previous episodes. So I do appreciate the uh, opportunity. Um, So I guess just referencing back to the to my post that I had made or whatever that you're talking about um, to give a little bit of, of uh, background and, and insight to it. I am tasked here uh, with the city of, of exactly what you just said. I'm, I'm trying to keep guys on board. Um, I'm trying to replace folks when needed and um, a lot of times I've, I've found that it's easier to, to train guys who are new to the field um, than it is to find experienced operators, um, especially in Idaho, you know, the whole state is rural here. So uh, people in general are few and far between, let alone experienced operators. So um, there's a lot that goes into that though. It's, you know, it's, it would be one thing if it was just a a typical a normal everyday job if we were talking about right. you know trying to find somebody to work at a grocery store or to work um at a, a department store or something like that it would be one thing but there's so many hands that are involved um in our industry so we have we have the uh federal regulators we have the state regulators and then based on their um, input and their regulations, we have to have uh, properly trained employees, properly trained operators that are licensed. Um, I know every state is different here in Idaho anyways. Um, 
we're, you're not even allowed to have an operator alone at a facility unless he's got a wastewater license. That poses a lot of issues for a lot of the smaller towns, especially um, because if you may have somebody who's a, a great employee, but they just haven't taken the time to, to get that license, um, either that or they are just struggling to pass the exam. The exams are not easy. Um, and if you don't have someone to mentor you and kind of help you through, it's a lot to take on by yourself. So what we have been doing is um, myself and a couple other, of other guys that we have here at the plant have taken it upon ourselves to um, stay after hours and offer to help um, our new employees study um, to help them train and, and kind of ask those questions that maybe they don't get to ask um, every day during the work hours, you know? Um, another, another part of the problem, as most any operator would know, um, when you take these exams, there's a lot of information on them and every facility is not the same. So you may have um, your experience in a conventional activated sludge plant, you sit down to take these exams and a quarter of the questions are on lagoons. Um, so you're, you're totally caught off guard. Um, there's just, there's a lot of, of struggles and a lot of work that goes into getting these licenses. Um, so that's, that's the state to the operator perspective. The problem I feel that we're really having though is, or that I'm experiencing anyway, is that you also have the limitations from the employer, whether it's a private uh, company or whether it's a municipality, um, their, their expectations and their understanding of what an employee is um, when compared to the expectations of the state sometimes don't always match up. So when the state requires you to have a license and um, you have to put in all, all of this, this time and effort in order to get the licensing and your employer doesn't recognize all of that personal hard work that you put in in order to get that license. Um, once you do obtain the license, you're, you're good by the state standards, but um, a lot of times your employer may not even see that as something that they're interested in paying for you to 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 go after um and so there it you know that a lot of times you kind of want to point fingers at who's to blame and i don't really think that's that's fair i think that i think that a lot of the issue that we have when it comes to getting um operators the the incentive the incentive to actually take these exams i think a lot of that comes down to just communication between um whoever your your managerial staff um for your for your municipality um between them and you know city hall or your city managers or or whatever that is i think there's just a there's a gap that needs to be bridged in communication there a lot of times um, I know that I've experienced that in a sense of I've, I've been trying to, uh, go to HR and really educate our HR department on what the actual, um, expectations from the state standpoint are for our facility. And you'd be amazed how even for a decent sized town, um, the folks at City Hall are really kind of caught off guard by that, that information. They don't really understand a lot of times what the expectations are. Um, for us, we're a class four facility, so the on collections and wastewater. So the state of Idaho requires that there's two class four uh, licenses at the or employed by the facility um, for both collections and treatment. So if you don't have those licensing, 
uh, licenses, then um, technically your plant is considered out of compliance. And, well, subject, to and subject to fine because of right, that, right? Right. Well, the problem there is, is if you're not going to incentivize your employees to get those licenses, we another another issue that we're experiencing in Idaho and I know across the the nation is that most of our class four or our upper class, whatever, I know every state's kind of different there too. In Idaho, a class four is, is where you top out. Um, a lot of our, our more experienced um, operators are retiring. Right. So, and, and as you kind of touched on, it's, there's not a whole uh, real big line of, of young, young blood standing at the gate wanting to, to come into the business. So um, an issue that you end up having is that if you're not going to incentivize your operators, um, then when those folks retire, you may have guys, gals that have been working for your facility for 10, 15 years that are still class one operators because why would they go and take the exam if they're not going to get a raise for it, if they're not going to get any sort of in any sort of incentive, right? And you know, from a from a professional standpoint, the way I've kind of approached things in my career, and I've been in wastewater for twelve years now, is that whether whoever I'm working for is going to incentivize and and pay me for those licenses or not, somebody will somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. But it is kind of a bummer to have to think that way. Think that, right. well, I like the place I work, but they're not willing to, to kind of meet me in the middle. So I'm going to have to find somewhere else to take my licenses. Um, but that's what's happening. Uh, and even, even here right now, one of the things that we are trying to, to uh, kind of address head on is we are, Jerome, Idaho is about uh, five, 10 miles away from Twin Falls, Idaho, which is one of the bigger towns in the state. So we kind of start to get the feeling that we're just a training ground for operators to go to places like Twin Falls, mm. to a lot of the other industries that are around here um, and actually get paid for the licensing that they have because, um, we do we have in the in the past have not had a very great incentive to give operators other than we'll we'll help you get all the licenses in the world because us from a managerial standpoint are willing to train um so a lot of times guys come in and they're like oh yeah well this is cool we'll get we'll get the training, we'll get all these licenses. And then once we're all licensed up, then we'll go somewhere else and make money. So, so in, I, I have a question in regards to the licenses are typically, is the cost for sitting for the tests and taking the courses, is that on the operator? Or does the city or the, you know, the entity take care of the cost for them to get the license? Now, I, every state or every uh, every city and, and employer kind of addresses that differently. Um, here in here in Jerome, we do pay uh, for the test once it's passed. So, okay, you know, if that's like a tuition reimbursement right. uh, program, you have to get a C or better for right. them to reimburse your, your tuition. Sure. Back. Okay, got it. Now, my my previous employer, there was there was a hundred percent on the operator, so it kind of kind of goes back and forth. Um, and it's kind of different everywhere you go, but you know, and that's all that's all well and good, but we we are in a in a uh, we're in an employee market, an employee driven market right now, right? And if a person's not going to be able to make money here, they're going to be able to make it somewhere else. So. Um, we really, in order to set up our uh, municipalities and, and these different private industries, in order to set us up ourselves up for success, we've really got to figure out ways to incentivize 
um, operators. I think that an issue and a problem that that a lot of uh, a lot of us are experiencing is that um, we we train folks. Some places don't, I guess, but we train folks the best we can to set them up for success. We should be as as managers, as as uh, professionals, we should be doing what we can for the next generation to help them along. And we do so, and then we feel as if our hands are tied because the people who are in positions to be able to keep these folks around um, are not willing, whether it be for whatever reason. There can be a, a plethora of different reasons. One of the one of the main reasons that that were one of the main things I'm struggling with right now is just the the amount of bureaucracy that's that's tied into the uh, HR programs and, and all these different things. Um, it's, it's really difficult to get the people, uh, these operators, the, the money and the things that they, they have earned, um, because of all of the different hoops that we've got to jump through. It feels like so, and I'm sure that that is not, you know, an isolated problem. It's probably not just you. It's that no. it's the typical setup, you know, of government and utility and private and public. And yeah, it's just all of the, the expression of the red tape, all yeah. the red tape of what you have to jump through. So something you would mention, uh, well, I was made aware of this when I actually interviewed an operator for um, MSW Magazine. I was not aware until I did that, that the amount of education and study, the hours alone to get what you were saying, that class four, and this was down in Texas, I don't, they have different rating systems, but it's equivalent what you're saying that this gentleman had the top level. And when you look at the amount of hours and the things that he had to know and be aware of, it was almost the equivalent of going through and getting your master's degree, right? a master's of science. And even though it's not quote unquote, a college degree, the amount of information and expertise that you're required to have to run these plants that your community relies on to stay healthy and safe. You know, you guys are my superheroes. This is one of the things that I always say on the show is that you really truly are my superheroes and they're unsung superheroes. And you're often not appreciated for, in many cases, the very dangerous job that you do to make sure that the rest of us are able to stay healthy. And so you had mentioned something about what you're trying to do is be a conduit or a middleman between operations and city hall. And what I'd love for you to share with the audience, because I'm sure you've got some peers that are in that same situation, Tom, that what have you been able to do or what are some things that you could share that have worked in order to help bridge that gap we were just talking about that that big gap that that needs to be brought closer and sealed up sure um so for myself i'm an operator uh first and foremost i i came up in the business from um i was a roofer and i needed a job real bad and i ended up in wastewater right i don't think <laughs> there's a lot of people who who woke up one morning and was like, man, I just, I dream of, of playing in, in poop, like for the rest of my life. So, yeah, I know, I know, I know. so, and I know that, that your listeners will all relate to that. Um, so I am an, I'm an operator at heart, um, regardless of, of my position. And so I really do connect and relate uh, with these folks. And I see, and I feel for the struggle that they're going through. Um, when it comes to being able to make an honest living doing a job that somehow you end up loving, right? Um, any of us who've been in this yep. for any amount of time, we're here because we actually, we enjoy our jobs. Um, we enjoy doing what we're doing. And we are kind of a, a special niche of people. Um, and so what I've been really kind of uh, working on is just kind of like I touched on earlier, trying to build the best relationship I can with our HR department, um, trying to have more open discussions, even though 
it's it's really dumb that it's so taboo uh, to talk about wages, especially in 2022 when we can talk about anything else in the world, but we can't talk about how much money we're getting paid. Um, so I've really tried to bridge that gap between um, our department and City Hall by having open con uh, communication with our city manager, um, building better one-on-one -on -one relationships with our with our mayor and our city council, um, and and just just doing my part to try to educate um, those folks in the amount of time, the amount of work, the amount of dedication that um, our guys have to have to put in in order to set this city up for success because as i was saying we're always at a point where if worst case scenario you know two people quit or something god forbid happen mm -hmm. then we're out of compliance and subject to fines and there's really not any reason for that when we have a a whole crew of of personnel here who are willing to put in the time to train and help um, help guys get their, their licensing and help, help folks climb up that ladder and, and get their ones and their twos and their threes and, and eventually their fours. And, and when they get to that point, they really should be recognized for that and not with a, with a subway gift card, you know, um, all of us have, we have lives to live out here and it's only getting more and more, uh, difficult, um, the the market's crazy and in a lot of these these smaller towns uh here in our state i hear of operators that are getting paid less than what they would get paid if they were working at the mcdonald's up the street wow. and that's just that's like heartbreaking um because you know we're we're really a, a blue collar group of of people and um we have a lot of pride in what we do, I feel like. And to feel like we're putting in all of this work and, and time um, and then not being able to even make a wage that, that we can take care of our families on is ridiculous. You guys deserve so much. You really, really do. And so that brings me to the, you know, I would say it's more of a series of questions, but um, if you were to give me, you know, we've kind of touched on these, but the three biggest challenges for, you know, retaining good talent, one, obviously wages, incentivizing education, but three biggest challenges that you see our industry is going to have going forward in being able to have enough people and the right people to do these very vital and essential jobs what do you see of the top three challenges and what do you see could be the top three answers or solutions to those challenges um first and foremost and it's kind of beating a dead horse here but but the biggest challenge i see um and we don't have much turnover here and and the the city i that i work for um they're really, really, they've been great um, to work for. They have had open ears on, on some of these subjects and they've been, been um, you know, real supportive. Um, so we haven't had much turnover. Uh, it seems like there's always a revolving two positions or so. Um, and then of course, as the city grows, we, we bring on new positions. So with that, when it's come, to hiring folks, one of the main things that that everybody, I mean, we all do it, uh, complains about is the wages, right? Um, I think that that a lot of it sometimes is is just sometimes guys like to complain, to be honest. Mm. But there is a there is a lot of validity to it when it comes to um, once you have actually obtained these licenses. Um, when you come in the, in the gate and you have no experience and you're upset because you're not getting paid the, the top dollar, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. The, the folks that just like to complain, 
Um, but when you've put in the effort, you've put in the time, you've, you've studied, you've um, taken the test, you failed the test, you've put the money into the classes, you've put the money into training, you've done all this, and you finally get that license and you're, you're excited, you're happy about it. Um, you can't wait to tell your boss, you can't wait to tell your friends <laughs> that you're working with and you come and you yeah. show them the license and everybody's stoked for you and real happy. And then the, the city or the, the private entity doesn't, doesn't recognize you for that. Doesn't give you any sort of, any sort of raise, any sort of bump of, of any sort. Um, that's typically where guys stop because that's a lot of work that went into what feels like nothing. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the main uh, issues. I think so definitely that, I, I'm what I'm hearing is a mindset and a perspective shift, right? As it relates to the importance and the value of the training and the licensing, right? Where that, that's where it seems like there's a really di big disconnect because it sounds like from what you're sharing or what I'm seeing, maybe this is just that buried thing that people don't talk about. Oh, we can't hire, we can't retain people, kind of. You know, it sounds to me maybe there's a lot more backstory to this, and and this could be, could be a critical issue that uh, we need to have a mind shift, or management needs to have a mind shift. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that one of the one of the things that has has just been kind of mind blowing to me is that these these uh these smaller municipalities and even some of the the bigger ones don't see the fact that helping these helping guys get their licenses only helps the future of the facility right it it isn't you know yeah you're going to kick somebody a couple what say even 10 grand a year it ends up being a few hundred bucks a check or something it's not it's not even anything that's that's real life changing, but you're if 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 that's all you can do for somebody, then that's all you can do for somebody. That's great. At least you've recognized that, mm -hmm. and you've set yourself up for success in the future because now you have operators who are working for you who know that okay, if if I do if I put in the work, then I will receive acknowledgement for the work that I've put in. And before you know it, you'll have a staff full of guys with the licenses. And from your standpoint um, at City Hall, you no longer have to really worry about what happens if so-and-so quits or what happens if so-and-so retires, because you have a whole line of people who can just slide right into that position that are already on, on the payroll. Um, Future-proofing. So that it's, you know, it's, was that true? You're, you're future-proofing your utility success. Right. Right. And, and yeah, so, so back to your original question, I guess the, the money is definitely, I, I believe the first and foremost thing that we struggle with as far as uh, retaining people. I think that um, the ick factor kind of comes into play for a, a lot mm -hmm. of new employers or new employees. Um, maybe they didn't really understand what they were signing up for. And that's that's a given. You know, you want people who are a good fit. So right. if if that happens, then all the all the luck to them and move on. You know, to the to the next person and and hope for the best. Um, and as far as the third, I think that um, a large struggle is back to that just being able to communicate with your city hall with your managers, um, uh, the owners, whatever it is of, of whoever you're working for, being able to communicate the needs of the state and, or the, the requirements from the state and being able to speak diplomatically enough to where, mm -hmm. You know the the folks you're talking to understand that you're you're actually looking out for the best for them. It's not just the best of yourself. Um, everybody wins in this scenario, so that that I think is can be challenging sometimes. Um, 
not only sometimes it's challenging and for certain certain folks in certain situations it's challenging to even get somebody to listen to you um and that's that's you know a, a problem all of its own and for other folks it's just being able to to like i said speak kind of diplomatically enough to to really let folks know that this isn't just you know tom trying to get tom more money um this is Tom trying to get Tom more money and also Tom trying to save your city and your facility from future issues because of the fact that it's a simple fix. Um, you, you incentivize the licensing, you incentivize your employees, and you build better operators. And in doing so, you're setting yourself up for success. You're taking care of these these folks families and everybody everybody wins in the end i love it i love it and so basically the bottom line is listen to your operators because they know what is needed for your system better than anyone else that's the bottom line they they understand the ins and the outs right yep yeah because at the end of the day at the end of the day the operators are the ones that are ultimately responsible for keeping keeping things running or you know what i say keep it keep it flowing right. and so you know it's i think that that really came across so thank you tom is it is that we have to talk to each other we have to talk to each other and not just talk to each other but listen right to each other that right. everybody needs a everybody needs a chance to voice it and even if and I've seen this, even when your opinion doesn't become something that has been put into effect, just being able to voice it and be heard and to weigh in can make a huge difference. Sure. You know, just, just with the perspective and just the, the whole corporate culture of an entity. So, um, again, you know, thank you for, you know, being willing to kind of put yourself out there as an <laughs> operator and really speak about this. You know, you spoke very honestly and from, from the heart about this, about this subject. And, um, I, you know, thank you for your service. You know, I know yep. we said that about our military, but, you know, for those of you out there listening, we need to say thank you for your service to those folks that work in our wastewater departments, work in our public works departments, on the streets and in the water department, because without them, we would not enjoy the lives that we do in this country. And, you know, never, ever, ever take, you know, I've traveled the world and, you know, I have an office in India and I'll tell you, you go to India and it will open your eyes as to just how lucky we have it. And you never, I, I know now I will never take turning on the tap and flushing my toilet for granted. And so, Tom, thank you again. And for those of you who are interested in connecting with Tom, maybe on LinkedIn, sharing, exchanging industry information, you can be found on LinkedIn. And I believe your LinkedIn handle is Thomas Mong, that's M-O-N-G, City of Jerome. So I invite you to connect with him and open dialogues. And thank you again for joining us on this week's episode of the Do Do Divas Smells Like Money podcast. And so until next time, keep it flowing. Thanks so much for joining me, the Do Do Diva, on this week's episode of Smells Like Money. What stood out to you this week? Share your takeaways by leaving me a review. You can find out more about the new technologies, creating sustainable solutions and insights on how to succeed in our vital industry by subscribing to the show. Whether you want to learn about the latest trends in wastewater infrastructure, treatment or trench lists, you've got it all right here at Smells Like Money. If you're an industry expert and would like to be considered as a guest for the show, book a quick chat with me by visiting calendly.com forward slash the Tuit group forward slash B dash A dash podcast dash guest, or simply click the link in the show notes below. Until next week, a big shout out to all my industry friends and those who will be. You are my superheroes. Thanks for tuning in, keeping it flowing, and we'll see you all next week.